Come on, let's stand up together. Buzzing, what is that buzzing? Better this Try to reboot. Amen, amen. Well, let's worship. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We're here today to give you glory. We're here today to bring glory to the name of Jesus, the Savior, the King, our King, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, Lord, you gave your very life to save whoever will. You said whoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life freely, Lord. You came to save. You came to save. We worship you, Lord. It's only your blood that can save. It's only your blood that washes sin away, Lord. You said, I will not remember their sin anymore. You'll blot it out. Though it be as scarlet, it shall be white as snow. We magnify the one who came and shed his blood so that our sins would be removed. Lord, we give you preeminent place in this meeting, in our lives, in our hearts. Oh, come and do all that you want to do, Lord. We bless you and we love you. We worship you today. Holy Spirit, thank you that you've been given from heaven to help us. Oh, we have a wonderful heavenly helper living right in our heart. And Lord, coming right into our midst, thank you where two or three are gathered in my name. You said, I am in the midst of you. Oh, thank you, Lord. So manifest your glory here. We believe for the glory of God, for heaven to be manifest in the earth. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. There's angels right here in this place this morning. They're here gathered with us to worship the King and to record what's happening in this place on the earth and report to heaven, Lord, and we thank you for that. We praise you. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done in every heart this morning, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Praise you, Lord. We love you, Father. Oh, we love you. We glorify you. Thank you for loving us and setting us free, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, when we were without hope, without help, without God and without covenant in the world, you sent your Son to redeem us. Thank you for it, Lord. We love you and we praise you. We glorify you, Lord, for all that you've done. You're a Father of kindness. Hallelujah. Lord, you're the father of kindness. We worship you. Let's give him glory together. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful. Faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Yeah. Faithful you are. And all your promises are yes and amen. All of them. Let's give him praise, Jesus. Praise your name, beautiful Savior. You have brought me near, pulled me from the ashes. You have broken every curse. Oh, blessed Redeemer, you have set this captive free. Yeah, oh Lord, I. Sing, faithful you are, faithful forever you will be, faithful you are, Woo. and all your promises are yes and amen, faithful, faithful. Yes and amen. Amen. Go oh, to your faithfulness. Amen. Come on, I will rest. And I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest. In your promises, my confidence, it's your faithfulness, and I will rest in 
your promises, my confidence, it's your faithfulness, I will rest in your promises, my confidence, it's your faithfulness, and you are faithful, yes you are faithful. Yes and amen. Give it praise. Faithful you are. Yes, Lord. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises. All your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. Hallelujah. Woo! Come on, we praise God with the angels this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, all of heaven is occupied with the praise of the King. We're entering into heavenly activity when we praise Him like that. Thank you, Lord. Oh, may it not just be on a Sunday morning for a few minutes, but may our lives always emanate the praise of the King. Amen. And in this way, we partner with heaven. We're partnering with heaven on earth. And oh, glory to God. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. Your faithfulness. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, that you watch over your word to perform it. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You're not a man that you should lie or the son of man that you should repent, Lord. But have you said it and will you not do it? Yeah. Yeah, you'll make it good. Thank you, Lord. You said heaven and earth will pass away, but your words will never pass away. Thank you, Lord. Your words are eternal. They're incapable of being changed. If we found a promise, we found something more solid than the ground we stand on. Oh, for his word is what made the ground we stand on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord. You said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll be with you to the very end of the age. Thank you, Lord. And then at the end of the age, we'll just slip on and be with Jesus forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, Lord. The atmosphere's changing. Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. Spirit of the Lord is here. Sing it again. The atmosphere. The atmosphere is changing now. Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. Spirit of the Lord is here. A miracle can happen. A miracle can happen now. For the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around. The evidence is all around. The Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord is here. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praised in your holy name, and 
And I sing praises, I sing praises, I give you honor, worthy Jesus. And I see glory falling in this place. And I see hope restored, the healing of all disease. And I sing praises, I sing praises, give you honor, worthy Jesus. And we give you praise and all of the honor, you are God, the one we live for. We give you praise and all of the glory, God. We give you praise and all of the honor.
You're worthy, Jesus. Worthy of praise and honor. Worthy. All of heaven stands to the tension. It says, Worthy. So, Lord, we respond in honor, recognition of the worthiness of the one we worship, Lord. And on the earth we stand. We declare your worth. We worship you, Lord. We can only imagine what it will be like the day we stand in your sight. That, Lord, you bought us for this. That we could live for eternity with you. So, Lord, we, we stir up our imagination. We stir up our heart. And, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity, even on the earth, to taste a little bit of what heaven will be. Oh, glory to God. But though now we see through a glass darkly, then we'll see him face to face. But, Lord, thank you for your glory and your presence, Lord. In your anointing, the veil is removed. In your spirit, Lord, there is the removing of a veil to at least the degree it can be. And we thank you for it, Lord.
Worship you. Come on, let's worship him, church. He's worthy of glory and praise and honor. Glory and majesty and honor are yours, Lord. Oh, worthy of honor and praise in the earth. Worthy, Lord, are you to receive glory from all that you made. Nothing here was made without you, Lord. But the tragedy is recorded in the book of John that those that he made didn't recognize him. And the very ones that he created didn't recognize him and rejected him when he came. But, Lord, you found us. You found us and you brought us out, Lord, so we recognize you. Thank you for opening our eyes, Lord. That doesn't make us better than anyone else. It just makes the lost found. Lord, we, we recognize you found us, Lord. It wasn't by our good deeds and our great effort. Oh, but you sought us out. You called us near, Lord, and we said yes. And Even today, you're looking everywhere to draw people to you. And some are saying yes and some are saying no, but Lord, we say yes to you. We say yes, thank you, Lord, for saving us. We say yes for an eternity with Jesus. We say yes to worship our King eternally. Thank you for it, Lord. Praise you, God. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, greet someone this morning. Come on, tell them you're in the right place at the right time with the right people. Amen. And then you can be seated and introduce yourself to somebody new, too. Hi, welcome to New Creation Church, a place you can call home. My name is Shelton. And my name is Brooke. If you're a first-time visitor, we would like to welcome you today. If you haven't already, please scan this QR code to fill out a guest card online, or we have paper copies for you out on the Welcome Center by the front door. We're so excited that you decided to join us today, and we would just like to say welcome to the family. Let's check out some of our upcoming events. Join us tonight at 6 p.m. for our Easter egg hunt wrap-up party. We will be doing a potluck style taco bar, so make sure to check out the sign-up sheet on the credenza. Listen up, youth kids. We will not be having youth group this Friday night. We'll be picking up again on May 3rd at 6.30 here at the church. We have a couple ministers coming up that we would like you to mark your calendars for. Pablo and Katie Ruiz from Ruiz Ministries will be here on May 5th for both of our services. Greg Fritz will be joining us on May 19th for both of our services. Leaders, we're moving our meeting from Friday night to Saturday so that he can minister to us. Dr. Mary Frances Varallo will be here on July 28th for both of our services and July 29th at 7 p.m. Monday night. Young adults, after our morning service on April 28th, we'll be meeting in the children's church room to have a pasta bar, play some games, and talk about what God has for us in this upcoming year. If you have any questions, please talk to Chris or Amber Goodnow after service. That's all the announcements that we have for you today. We'll see you guys tonight at 6 p.m. and remember to be the light. All right, Taco Sunday. Apparently, we're having a taco bar tonight. I hope you guys can be with us. And <clears throat> we're wrapping up the Easter egg just with a big fellowship and, and time together. And it's going to be a great time. Thank you all for for helping those of you that that helped with that and um 
Man, what a blessing and, and what an awesome time we had together. Had over a thousand uh, people on the property and then uh, gave a bunch of stuff away over, you know, three, over $3,500, $4,000 worth of stuff. Praise the Lord. Cool things, bikes and different things to the kids. And so thank you for, for being a part of that. Um, amen. So, so join us tonight, 6 o'clock, and uh, we're going to have a good time <clears throat> eating some tacos. Praise the Lord. Uh, man, great meetings coming up. Something for the young adults, something for the youth. Praise the Lord. Every week we got something for the kids and for the adults. Praise the Lord. We got ladies prayer Wednesday mornings. We got men's prayer Saturday mornings. There's something for everybody. Amen. Uh, so it's time to be a part of what God's calling us to do in this generation. Amen. Well, let's receive our tithes and offerings this morning. If you need an envelope, uh, lift your hands up high. The ushers will come by and get you an envelope. You can give cash and get tax credit for that if you fill that out. You can always give cash and put it in the bucket, but if we don't know who give it, we can't give you tax credit for it, but the Lord will give you credit for it. Praise the Lord. Uh, he sees. Amen. And um, <clears throat> thank you so much. Many of you have been, already been donating to the Kenya trip for Shelton and Brooke and myself. That's coming up in June. Um, <clears throat> actually, last Monday, the 8th, uh, we were supposed to have all of our money in for the airline tickets, which airline tickets to Kenya are uh, in the $2,400 range, somewhere close to that. And uh, so, uh, praise the Lord, we, had, we sent that money last week, and we had all that money come in, praise the Lord, and so, and even a little bit more, amen. So, praise the Lord for that and for your faithfulness. And I know that Brooke and Shelton sent some partner letters out to family and friends, and they, others have been donating from other places, but much of the donations have come right here from within our church. <clears throat> and I'm so thankful for that. We're I'm thankful for everyone that gets to be a part of what God's doing, but um, it's a blessing to know that um, part of the, one of the bigger parts of our purpose <clears throat> is missions and nations and that the people in this church carry that or else you wouldn't be given if you didn't. Praise the Lord. And you wouldn't be going if you didn't. And so we're going to go with, uh, <clears throat> with mom and um, some from the Glenwood church, uh, a couple families from the Glenwood church, and there's 12 of us total. We're going to be with Pastor Justice and Margaret Achuro and their ministry there. And if you've been here when they've been here, they've always been super great and just fun to be around and, and uh, full of wisdom. Uh, you guys, you know, maybe don't get to see that quite as much. We get to talk to them afterwards at lunch or dinner or whatever and just hear. Uh, I think they said there's over, they've planted over 100 churches uh, through crusades and different things through that ministry. Uh, and I, I believe it said in the welcome packet that we got that Pastor Justice is basically an overseer over like 50 churches that they've established. So they're not just doing one church, but they've got some, uh, some orphanages, some boys' homes, uh, uh, churches, crusades. There's going to be something, lots of things for us to do. There'll be pastor's conference, leadership conference, uh, churches on Sunday, ministry to the kids, uh, Bible school. They've got a huge you know, a large Bible school there that they're training. Great things are happening there in Kenya, and so we're going to get to be a part of that. Um, you know, I was talking to Pastor Mark Hankins a little while back when he was down in Glenwood, and he said, uh, of course, um, they go to Nigeria quite a bit, and they've been in Kenya a lot too, and Tanzania. Uh, Pastor Hankins' life really got turned around in Tanzania, if you heard his story, his testimony of how his dad sent him to the mission field after he crashed his 56 Chevy when he was a teenager and took his car away from him and sent him off to Africa. And he was in he was in Tanzania in Dar es Salaam for a few months there with the missionary they knew and God really turned his life around in Africa and now uh, you know we know what he does <clears throat> and how God's using him today. And so, but I was talking to him and he was saying if there is a uh, there's such a move of God in in uh, Nigeria, which is not next to Kenya but it's across the way, you know. But in Kenya and Nigeria both, and in some other nations in Africa, there's tremendous things. God's doing tremendous things. But Pastor Mark actually said, if there's an on-fire church in Europe right now, you know, Europe's kind of like America where it's pretty dry and, you know, intellectual and not much fire and not much God stuff. But he said, when you find a vibrant on-fire church in Europe, chances are it's pastored by a Nigerian. These Nigerians have, let, have gone, got sent out by the move of God there and went into Europe and started planting churches and the fire of God on them is hitting the people and they're raising up. And so some of that similar stuff is even happening in Kenya. So we get to be a little bit of a part of that. We haven't 
I've been to Kenya. I've been, we took a team from the church in 2008 to Burkina Faso. We went to, uh, <clears throat> which is pretty close to Nigeria. We went there um, and uh, flew into a Ouagadougou and then went to uh, Bobo Dialasso. I had crusades and, and ministered to pastors. And man, it was just a great time. And so I'm excited more than, you know, what, 15 years later to go back, more than 15 years later to go back to Africa. So thank you guys. And we still have $2,000 to meet our bare minimum, and we've got a little bit of time here to, to get that in for me, Brooke, and Shelton, the three of us. But that's just to, to get the bare bones expenses covered. I always like to take a big offering with us so that when we go, we can be a blessing to the church and the pastors and those that we're connected with. And so just so you can be in faith with us, we're, we're believing for uh, more than 2,000. Probably be good to have another 4,000 or 5,000 come in or 10,000, I mean, whatever. The Lord's not limited. Why not ask big? Praise the Lord. So that we can do some big things when we're there in the nation. So I wanted to make sure you guys were aware. Thank you so much for those that are already donating. Thank you for those that are praying with us and believe in God. I believe that uh, we're going to get everything uh, that he needs us to get to go. And then we're going to give everything we've got to give when we're there. And then we're going to bring everything back that we got to bring back when we come back home. And uh, that's a little while out. You saw the great ministers we have coming up, uh, Pablo and Greg Fritz, and Pablo and Katie and Greg Fritz and, and Mary Francis, and I've got a couple others in the works for summertime or maybe fall, and uh, so praise the Lord. Ready to receive the offering. I'm going to turn to a scripture. <laughs> it's going to be Mark 12. We'll just see if you're flowing in the Holy Ghost, whether you know which verse. <laughs> Mark 12, verse 41. And it says, Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. I just want you to think about that for a minute. Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. God's actually watching how we give. Jesus is watching how you give. I found out this week, I guess maybe I knew it, but knew it more, uh, uh, the lady that wrote the divine revelation of hell that we went a little through, and I encourage some of you guys to read it. Well, she also was taken 31 days after those encounters in hell. She was taken by the Lord to heaven uh, to, to have a tour of heaven, and she also wrote a book called The Divine Revelation of Heaven, and so I I read that this week, and so uh, a couple of the things in that book that, that, that stood out to me, there's a number of things, and um, I, I, you know, I get to preach and do the offering, so mine mix together when I do it that way. It's just how it works, and uh, so thank you for your, your leeway, and I'm just helping you set your expectation. <laughs> this Sunday night, tonight, we have the taco party. Next Sunday night, I, I believe... I have an unction just to to have a, it's not really a movie night, but it's uh, there's a, a YouTube video of Brother Jesse Duplantis recounting his trip to heaven. He went to heaven in 1988, and uh, he recounts that in detail at a, at a church, uh, might have been his church, I'm not sure, but um, it's great high quality video. I watched it here this week, and I, I believe that's something we all need to see. And so I'm going to, I believe we're going to show that not this Sunday night, not tonight, but a week from tonight. Um, so I, I'd love to have you be a part of that. And, and uh, we need to, we're going to learn a little bit more about heaven this morning. Um, the Bible says so much about heaven. It's amazing that people think heaven and hell aren't real with as much as the Bible talks about it, or even angels. Sometimes there's so much in the Bible about angels. And then sometimes we wonder if these things are real. Well, I mean, the Bible is is just chock full of, of references to heaven and to angels and uh, less so about hell, but there's still plenty of stuff in hell. Uh, God came to save us from the devil's hell. It was made for the devil and his angels, and he came to bring everyone out. And there's nobody that needs to go to hell. He's given everybody the way out, but you have to choose that you want that because if you don't want out, then you're choosing to go in. <laughs> well, there's only one way out now. Here I am in the offering, preaching a salvation message. It's tough to get away from it. There's one way out, and Jesus is the way. Amen. And we'll share a little bit more about that here in a minute. I want you to notice here, so I was reading in this book, 
the divine revelation of heaven. And uh, she started to talk about um, <clears throat> what the Lord showed her as he gave her a, a tour and different angels. And the Lord at times took her around heaven and showed her some things. And, and uh, she, the, these angels took her to what she called the room of records. She said there's great rooms in heaven where records are kept. We know about the Lamb's book of life that no one will enter into heaven unless his name is found written in the Lamb's book of life. And if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, he said those folks are cast with the devil into the lake of fire for eternity. So you really want your name in that book. Remember how Jesus said, don't rejoice that the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book. And so God's a big one for writing stuff down, apparently. <laughs> We're learning some of this stuff. There, there's scripture about it that we can see right here in the scripture. But as, as she went to heaven and was told to report back to the earth so people could believe these things were real, one of the things the Lord showed her was this big room of records. And she said, I was amazed to see a room of records in which meticulous records were being kept. The angel said that God has his angels keep records of every church service on earth and every service in a home where he is lifted up and praised. So there's angels in here right now. She says in a different part of the book, the Lord gave her vision in the spirit to see back into the earth, a small country church, 30 people, and the pastor standing up preaching, and a big angel up on the roof, and angels standing, one on either side of the pastor, two down at the ends of the platform, a couple midway back, a couple others at the back, and said, every church service, these angels stand guard, and they watch, and they record the messages that are preached, and the people that get saved, and different things, the honor that, that gets brought forth, and, and so many things. And so, one of the things uh, that I just thought was interesting, because, you know, Pastor Hankins, I, I, I quote from him a lot just because I like him, and I think he's smart, and he also says things good. They kind of stick with you. But he said, you don't have to go far to find someone that thinks like you do. But it's hard to find someone that thinks like God. Because he said, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, says the Lord. <laughs> Isaiah 55, right? So it's like it's pretty hard to find someone that thinks like God. So people have their thoughts about offering time, about money. You can get some people out there in the world, and you just bring up the church or money or offering, and they'll just go off and spin off into a broken loop. A broken record loop of how, all, you know, all this, well, that's wicked. That, you know, these people are just selfish and great. They got their ideas. And sadly, that's because there's been people in the church that have done the wrong things with money. Okay, don't get mad at me, but there might be somebody right here in this service in the church that's doing the wrong things with money. I'm not talking about from the pulpit, although I, I lay my heart bare before the Lord, too. We're all going to give account. It's not just what the pastors are doing with the money. It's what the people are doing with the money. There is one who scatters and yet increases. There is one that withholds more is right, more than is right, and it tends to poverty. The Lord, the things the Lord gave you are for glorifying Him. Your breath, your body, your strength, your mind, your imagination, your skills. He gives you power to get wealth that, me has, that he may establish his covenant. Deuteronomy 8.18. The Lord gives you power to get wealth, not the devil. The devil's trying to take your power away. The devil doesn't give power. He takes it. The Lord gives you power to get wealth. Why? Deuteronomy 8.18. That he may establish his covenant, which he swore. God, everything on the earth was made by the Lord and for him. And, and we're in a season right now. We're pinching up to the end of this age, guys. The, the last days, what we call this dispensation, the church age, started, excuse me, on the day of Pentecost. Because Peter got up and preached and he said, these are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So in the last days, that began what we call the last days. The day of Pentecost, over 2,000 years ago, began what the Bible calls the last days. And we're pinching up to the last of the last days. And when we come to the end of this age, there's a seven-year period at the end of this age called the tribulation that you don't want to be here for. I'm just telling you, you don't. The Bible's clear on it. Praise the Lord. And... Uh, that, at the end of those seven years, will trigger the next age, which is called the millennium, a thousand-year reign of Christ, and the Satan will be chained by, by an angel. Just one angel is going to come down and bind him up. 
For a thousand years, he's going to be bound. And we're going to float around on, har- on clouds and play harps for a thousand years. No, that's not what we're going to do for a thousand years. It actually said the believers will rule and reign with him. He might give you, depending on your faithfulness, you remember the parable of the, of the, the talents in one of them? He said uh, the one he gave one, you know, just hit it. The one he gave two, doubled it to four. The one he gave five, doubled it to ten. And, and when he found out and gave a, found out what they did with it, the one that doubled from five to ten, he said, uh, well done, good and faithful servant. Have Rule, have, have authority over 10 cities. Eh? Play on 10 clouds? No, have authority over 10 cities. See, see when, we, when we step, here I am bleeding into the message again, but when we step into heaven, it's not, we're not just going to be floating. We're going to be ruling. We're going to be reigning. We're going to be serving. We're going to be praising. We're going to be, we're going to be busy doing the things. There's a whole world up there on planet heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so, <laughs> I might have got so far down that rabbit trail, I need the Lord's help to get back out. I don't know, but praise the Lord. Uh, it's important what we do on the earth, and we need to think like God thinks. And people do their things but, and think the way they think, but we are really responsible to learn to think how God thinks. Let me just share this just about how God thinks here, even about the offering. I just read it to you from the Scriptures. From Mark 12, 41, now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. He was watching hearts. He's looking for motives. Everything that was made was made by him and for him. And we're coming up to the end of this age where there will be a restoration of all things. That's the trail I was on. (laughs) Thank you, Lord, for reminding me. Uh, We came to the end of this age where the end of this age is the time of restoration of all things back to the Lord. You should be feeling that in your heart right now. We're coming to the end of this age. You begin to feel the things of the next age when you get close to the end of the one you're in. We should be feeling in our heart, man, we want to give to the Lord glory. We want to give Him everything we have. We want to give Him our life. We want to give Him our worship, our praise, our energy, our effort, and whatever things He gives us, we want to yield it to Him. Lord, to the glory of Your name I live. Like that should be the anthem of the saints at the end of the age. And I think that'll separate the saints from the ain't. We're living in a world that wants to clone us for it, for the devil. And so you got to check, check up. Who am I living for? Am I living for pleasure? Am I living for convenience? Am I living for money? Am I living for promotion? What is it that I'm living for? Or am I living for Jesus? Because a lot of Christians aren't living for Jesus. So-called Christians, I can't judge that. Only the Lord can judge whether people are really Christians, but by your fruit you shall know them, the Lord said. Right? But anyway, heaven might not be that awesome for you if you don't really like Jesus. Because it's all about Him. Now, I'm, I'm kind of joking because heaven is going to be awesome. When we get there, what's going to happen is the veil of our hearts that made us think Jesus wasn't worth living for is going to be lifted, and we're going to see how glorious he is and realize he was worth living for all along. How did I not see that? That's what's going to happen. You know what I'm saying? So I'm just kind of joking and poking at the same time here because we need to see this now. It's better to see it now than wait till we get to heaven because, you you know, I heard somebody with Reinhard Bonnke, one of these evangelists, I don't know, they were talking about young people being saved. And Maria Woodworth Edder, she was a great healing evangelist in the 18 to 1900s here in America in the Midwest. I mean, outstanding miracles. Wrote a whole book, Diary of Signs and Wonders by Maria Woodworth Edder. You'll read that and it shocks you how the, the miracles God did and the people that got saved. And she would rejoice over, the, she called them the whiteheads that would get saved, you know. I'm starting to get a little white on my head. It's like stuff starts coming out I'm like, what in the world? that's all right. Brother Jesse, his hair is just white as can be. I'm like, I'll do white. I guess it's better than you know, whatever. I don't care. Anyway, she's, she would get excited. These white heads would get saved. Hey, there's one there. Hey, Tom, I'm coming to the club, man. You, you've been there a little while. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What, what does that mean? That means people that were at the very end of their life, and they were close to stepping into eternity without knowing the Lord, but they got saved in her meeting. And how she would rejoice that somebody that was so close to slipping into an eternal hell got delivered. But then right on the other hand, 
They talk about if someone young gets saved, you not only save a life, you save a lifetime. A lifetime is saved too. God wants to save young people so that they live their life for him, bringing glory to him, doing his bidding and storing up rewards for eternity. You might not think that's a big deal, but there's a day coming when that's going to be the only big deal. And we need to see with the eyes of eternity now. Okay, so I'm trying to get on it here. So he showed me. God keeps records on those who are out of his will also. This is what I'm reading from her book again. He showed me how God's angels keep records of the money that is given in the church services. Along with the record of the attitudes with which the people contribute. I'm just letting you know that Jesus is still watching how people give today. He told me of people who have money but won't give to the work of the Lord. Apparently that gets recorded. I thought of how Jesus carefully watched the offering in the treasury of the scriptures I just shared. <clears throat> well, apparently angels have, he said they had uh, uh, papers, white, bright white with gold lining around them, and they would record everything that happened in the service. They would record everybody's giving and the attitude with which you gave. Was it grudging? Was it under compulsion? Was it free will? Was it joyful? Was it worshipful? Was it an act of honor? Or was it something else? Come on. You think God doesn't see all this stuff already? I mean, I don't know who we think he is. Like, we're hiding stuff from him. No, we're not hiding from him. He sees our heart. Like, doesn't he? Come on. <laughs> well, one day we're going to give account of our heart to the Lord. Might as well get things right now. Might as well let him get it right now. Praise the Lord. All right, let's receive the offering. Father, we thank you. Oh, that you watch how we put money into the treasury. Why? Because all things were made by you and for you and through you. And Lord, everything we have is really for your glory, our lives included. Certainly, any, any finances we have. And, uh, you know, it can be common where we start thinking, no, that's my money. I worked for that. I worked hard for that. I sacrificed for that. Well, that's true. There's a part of that that's true. But who gave you the strength? Who gave you the wisdom? Who gave you life? Who gave you anything you have to be able to do that? It still comes back to a recognition that all things come from you, Lord. So as we give today, Lord, I want our hard attitudes every time we give to be right so that what the angels write down in the book brings glory to Jesus <laughs> rather than shame to men. So, Lord, let our hearts be pure before you. If there's impurity, Lord, send the fire of your word into our hearts to, to remove that chaff, to remove that impurity and skim the dross off the top. Lord, burn a fire in our heart that our mind and heart would be right concerning material things and concerning our own life and concerning what you're worthy to receive. So as we bring our tithes and offerings this morning, Lord, we do it from an attitude of honor. We choose to do it with a joyful heart for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Hallelujah. Let the angels write down that they gave laughing. They gave laughing. They, that's a laugh off. There, they were laughing when they gave <laughs> instead of crying, you know. Oh, but we were joyful in our giving because we just thought, oh, he's worthy of it all. So, Lord, we give that way and help us to always keep our hearts right in these matters and other matters of, of heart importance in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, ushers, pass the buckets. Thank you. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. So, you got some of my message in there, but. You didn't get any of my jokes, so I'll give you a couple jokes here. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Before we go on. <clears throat> maybe, maybe you didn't know, but uh, uh, you can be oversaved. <laughs> These are jokes. You know, the, you might be a redneck if. These are, you might be oversaved if. You know. <clears throat> maybe you, I saw a comedian saying some of these things. I thought he was funny. He said... Uh, if you don't mess around with computers because they have a cursor, you might be oversaved. <laughs> if you rebuke vacuum cleaners because they're called dirt devils, you might be oversaved. <laughs> I put this one in. If you're at the grocery store and they ring you up and the total comes to 666 and you decide you better throw in a pack of gum because you don't want the total to be 666, <laughs> you might be oversaved. <laughs> Or, 
You go to move it in an apartment, and the number is 666. And you, and you say, I'm not living there. You might be over saved, praise the Lord. What I mean is over religious, you know. But anyway, it's kind of funny. If you won't eat pizza unless it's been delivered, <laughs> you might be over saved. All right. So, <laughs> anyway, I thought those were kind of funny. <clears throat> Pastor interrupts his message to ask three men on the front row. I don't have any men here, so I guess we're safe on the front row, that they, what they would want their loved ones to say as they look down at their coffin. The first one says, I'd want them to say I was a good husband and a good father. The second one says, I'd want them to say that I lived a good life and was kind to others. The last one says, I'd want them to say, hey, look, he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> People think of these things. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> well, I saw this one, last one. I'll just. <clears throat> Did you ever send out the little emojis? I don't, I mean, emojis, these little guys, the little symbols and emotions or whatever. I just found out that the hands together emoji that I've been using for prayer is really a high five. So all these people are out here suffering, and I've been high five, high five. <laughs> Somebody going through all this stuff, and we're like, "Woo!" <laughs> you better go look at it because I think it is a high five, but it really looks like praying hands too. So I, anyway, I just thought that was funny, and I'm sure the people that you messaged knew what you meant. Praise the Lord! But I just thought that was funny. Oh Lord, help us. <clears throat> Open our eyes, Lord, to see into your realm, for there is a kingdom realm of God. It's a real realm, and Lord, we are really that realm, the kingdom is in us if we believe. Oh, thank God, and the Lord of the kingdom is in us if we believe, and so Lord, we do believe, we choose to believe, and we thank you, Lord, for giving us insight into your realm and teaching us how to be soul winners, Lord Jesus. I'm asking you to teach this church, myself included how to be soul winners. We need to be. We might be afraid to be or we might think we're unqualified to be or there might be 20 other reasons why we would like to exempt ourselves, but we need to be soul winners, Lord, in the last days. The age of harvest is upon us, the end of the age, and we are here for such a time as this. And if there's one thing that we really need to pray, uh, you know, that's super important, there's more than one, but this is one of them, Lord, that we would become soul winners. Teach us how. There's not a lot of things more important. There's not a lot of things more important. So, Lord, I'm asking you to teach us to be soul winners today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been talking about evangelism, and, you know, it's one thing when a pastor teaches about evangelism. <laughs> Paul told Timothy, young pastor, do the work of an evangelist. And we can teach what the Scripture says. It's a little different when an evangelist teaches evangelism. There are gifts in the church that God calls an evangelist where he actually puts a gift inside of that person's heart, just like he put a, a, a shepherd's gift in a pastor, a teaching gift in a teacher or a whatever, a prophetic gift, a seeing gift in a, in a prophet or a seer. He, can, he puts an evangelistic gift in an evangelist. And, you know, if according to Hebrew, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4, when Jesus led captivity captive, he gave gifts unto men. He gave some po pastors, some teachers, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. I had them out of order. He gave these five ministry gifts. God put gifts in people and gave them to the church and said, I'm putting something in them for you. I'm giving this person as a gift to you, church. And we recognize the gift of pastor. We recognize many times the gift of teacher, Uh most of the time, folks recognize the gift of evangelists. You know, in the church world, it's kind of been recognized. Um, there's also gift of apostle and prophet. And some people say, well, those ones have been passed away with. And I'm just going to ask you, if you believe that, show me the scripture. Because <laughs> it actually, if you keep reading in Ephesians 4, he said, these were all given to the body of Christ that we would not remain children, but that we would grow up in all things into the full measure of the stature of Christ and into the perfect unity of the faith. And we're not there yet. So it said these were given until, so from my interpretation of those scriptures, it's clear that all five of these gifts are still in the church world today. 
But uh, we've had a couple evangelists here through the, through the years, and I like to bring, uh, bring some more. The, the evangelists bleed soul winning. I mean, they, all they want to do is win souls. They don't want to build something on the church. They want to save souls. They don't want money to go to this or that, build a bigger building. They're like, save souls. And so actually you can get clashes between pastors and evangelists because pastors might be putting resources in areas to disciple people, and we're supposed to. But the evangelists are coming in and saying, get somebody saved with that. Well, that's right too. Which one's right? Which one's wrong? Both are right. Neither is wrong. But there must be a cooperation now. Because the, the Great Commission is not only to save souls, to save people, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. Notice it didn't say he that's not baptized shall be condemned. Anyway, I want to get into fights over baptisms. But Brother Hagin, when he was a young teenager and he went to hell three times and he kept coming back, the Lord called him back up in a voice in a language he didn't understand. And as he came back up, he started shouting to the Lord, Lord, I'm a member of the church. I've been baptized in water. He's trying to reason with the Lord. I shouldn't be going down. I should be going up. I'm the member of a church. I've been baptized in water. Neither of being a member of a church or being baptized in water will save you. It's only believing the gospel of Jesus Christ that will save you. Now, water baptism is important, and being a member of a church is important, but they, they aren't of saving value. That's something you do after you're saved, that you begin to develop and identify with Christ and begin to let his light shine out of you. Amen. And so uh, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. Amen. Well, we're supposed to do that. All of us are. An evangelist, their heart bleeds that. But I'm a pastor teaching you, so it comes across a little different. But, uh, but, but we still need this. We still need to be equipped to do what God's called us to do in the day that we live in. There is a hell to shun. There is a heaven to gain. God wants people to go to heaven. He doesn't want a single person to go to hell. It's not God's word that one person goes to hell. Look at your whole neighborhood. He doesn't want one of those people to go to hell without him. He sent Jesus so they could all make heaven, not just in your neighborhood, the whole city. But this is just a tiny little speck of a city up in the middle of nowhere, a, a town you might call it. But look in the big cities. Look, in the, look at Manila, Philippines, 20 million people or more, 26 million in one city. He doesn't want one of them to go to hell. He wants everyone to come to repentance and the knowledge of the Son of God. Amen. But he's called us to be his messengers. <laughs> oh, man. Is it possible to limit God? You don't think you can limit God? Well, in one way you can't. In another way you can. It says the children of Israel limited the Holy One of Israel. And let me just show you the picture of that. We could limit God by he wants to get everybody saved, but we refuse to send this message out. The way that we can limit him is because he made us his body. And our obedience and yieldedness to him and his spirit and his will is a determining factor of how much of God's will can come through into the earth. So on one side, we can't limit God like take away his power or make, him, make ourselves bigger than him or anything like that. But right on the other hand, because God has chosen to use the church to execute his purposes on the earth, we can actually be a governor, a deterrent, or a limiting factor in the, in the will of God. And I don't want to be a limiter. I want to be a, I want to be a catalyst. I want to be a, <laughs> a cooperator, right? I want to be a co-laborer. Amen. So I was reading this. This is Brother Hagin's book, I Believe in Visions. And if you want to read his story, this is a good one to read, how he was raised up off a deathbed when he was young and went to hell three times and then got saved and went up to heaven and then, you know, became a preacher. And, and after he became a preacher, he said, he was just young. He was probably 17, 18 years old after that happened. And he said, I'd go down uh, uh, into the city square. He said that was the days, the depression days, the Great Depression. He said uh, people weren't mostly at work, so there were plenty of folks on the street. Even in a small town, you'd go down, folks would be just about town. And he said, I'd go down there and say, he said, I was so glad that I wasn't going to hell because I'd just been to hell three times. But then I got saved by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus. And that fourth time I died because he was in this deathbed condition. The fourth time I died after I got saved, I went up instead of down. And I saw glimpses of heaven. And then the Lord sent me down and said, uh, uh, you can't come up here now. 
your work on earth is not through. And so he came back down, and he knew God called him to be a preacher. And, and he said to his mom and his grandma on, their, on the deathbed there, I'm not going to die now. And, and, and uh, they thought that he meant, you know, at this moment, you're not going to die. But he, he knew that the Lord said, your whole life in front of you is to be a preacher. He said, now I'm not going to die. I'm going to be raised up off this deathbed, is what he was saying. Well, after he got raised up off the deathbed, which the story's in here, uh, and uh, he, he, said for, he said for 16 months, every single night, he said, I praised myself to sleep because I wasn't going to hell. Folks that have seen it, like this woman, like others that have gone, and they see how real hell is and how terrible and tormenting and horrible it is. He said for 16 months, he, actually he said for 70 years, when I heard the message that he was teaching it, he said, this year it will be 70 years since the day I was raised up off my deathbed and had that encounter. And he said, every single day for 70 years, I've thought about dying. Not afraid to die. He said, now I was so glad because I knew I wasn't going to hell. But he said, it marked me so much that every single day for 70 years, I thought, oh, thank God when I die, I'm not going to hell. And he said, specifically for 16 months after that encounter, every single night, he said, I went to sleep, praising God to sleep. I didn't go to sleep, just fall asleep. He said, I'd start praising God. Thank you, Lord, that I'm not going to hell. Thank you, Lord, that you saved me and my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Oh, God, I'm so thankful. And he began to praise and he would just praise himself to sleep for 16 months every single night. He had an encounter with the Lord, but. And others, this woman was the same way, where she, for 31 days after her, her trips to hell, and she was commissioned by the Lord to write about it, and I gave you the name of the book, and, uh, because the Lord wants people on earth to know these things are real, because the enemy's out there messing with people's minds, telling them it's just an imagination, it's just made up. Well, it's not just made up. The Bible's clear on it. So, you know, people can have their own thinking and make up what they want to say, but that doesn't change what's going to happen. What does the boss say? That's what I want to know. What does the boss say? What does the guy in charge say? Because people that are working can say whatever they want to say, but when it comes down to authority and submission, I want to know what the guy in charge says. What does coach say? What does the principal say? What does the boss say? Tell me what the boss says about all this. That's what I want to know because that's what matters. See, when it comes to these things, God's the boss. God the Father, he's the boss. Hallelujah. And Jesus, his son, is working with him. Amen. And so for 31 days after her trips to hell, she couldn't even sleep. She was tormented by it. What she saw got so deep. So the Lord, to remedy that, took her to heaven. She, again, between, she said between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. for 30 days in a row, Jesus showed up and appeared to her in her sleep and took her to hell and toured her of hell, and she wrote the book. And then after 31 days, she was so marked by that and unable to really heal up was in torment. She'd wake up screaming. She would tell people, be saved, repent of your sin. And everybody thought she was crazy because she was telling about hell and the reality of hell. And uh, so the Lord took her to heaven and began to give her a tour of heaven. And this divine revelation of heaven came out of that. It healed her heart and cleansed her heart. Well, Brother Hagin, as a young boy, he said he'd go out to the city streets there during the Great Depression. He'd say to him, hey, did you know I'd know hell was real, even if I didn't have the Bible? And they'd be like, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And so there's his open door. He would tell him his experience and how he went to hell and how Jesus saved him and going to the church doesn't save you and water baptism doesn't save you, but calling on the name of Jesus and, and, and accepting his sacrifice and his blood shed for you saves you, man. Do you know I could, that's what he would say just as a teenager. Do you know I knew hell was real even if the Bible didn't exist? <laughs> The people start thinking, we need to come up with some creative ways to get people's hearts opened up about some of this stuff. Because people just want to la, 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 that doesn't exist, but it does. <laughs> so you can la, la, la all you want, but we're not guaranteed tomorrow. I mean, if we were, we could just say, well, we got time. But there was folks that this lady ran into in hell that they thought that very thing, I got time. And then they got hit by a bus on the way home. I'll give my life to the Lord later. Well, you're not guaranteed later. He said, today is the day of salvation. Call upon the Lord while he is near. Now is the acceptable time. Folks keep thinking I want to play around a, a, a little longer and not give my life to the Lord. Why do you want to do that? You're not guaranteed tomorrow. It's not worth the risk of eternity in hell. Why don't you want to live for Jesus? You want to have to give this? You ain't giving nothing up that ain't killing you anyway. 
What you're going to get is way bigger than what you're giving up. Jesus doesn't take away from you stuff of value. He takes the junk off, the dross, the impurity, the death. That's all he takes off, and he gives you life more abundantly, and he gives you joy unspeakable and full of glory, and he gives you peace that passes understanding, and he gives you a place in the family, and he makes you a child of God, an heir of God, and joint heir with Christ. I'm, not, I'm an heir of God. Man, and you don't want that? We need to have a checkup from the neck up. You don't want that? Come on, if you saw it clear, you'd want it. And that's why we're sharing some of these things. We need to see it clear as the church. We're the ambassadors. We're the workers. Yes. We're the ambassadors of Christ. You know what your message is? It's about him. So I, I encourage you to get to know him better. Because yes. he's something, man. Yes. Woo! <laughs> Jesus. Oh, I just like Jesus. I, okay. Are we doing all right? I'm trying. Okay, because th this is out of his book here. I preach like a fat man caught in a barbed wire fence. No. <laughs> a point here and a point there. <laughs> uh, so I gave you a few points. Now, I've been caught in some barbed wire fences. I got scars to prove it coming up my arms on both sides. Uh, grew up on a ranch and <coughs> been through some of those. It's not too fun. Um, I found out when a cow's chasing you, you can jump over those fences, <laughs> even though white boys can't jump, and I couldn't. But, man, when you got a cow chasing you, you'd be amazed what you can do. Incredible feats of adrenaline. He's, he's explaining this first vision Jesus appeared to him after he was raised up from his deathbed. Jesus appeared to him a number of different times, <clears throat> starting in 1950. This was in 1950. He's relating that in this vision. <clears throat> and he actually was having a meeting in Rockwall, Texas, which I've never been there, but he called it the black land of north central Texas. And he said, uh, uh, there's a saying that if you stick with the black land when it's dry, it'll stick with you when it's wet. <laughs> so he said, uh, he said they had these outdoor tent crusades, but it was raining. So not many people came because it was so muddy. So there was about 40 people that showed up and there was water running down the aisles and everything. And so, but up on the platform, it was dry. But he said, I invited people, gave a short Christian message because everybody there was just Christians, just a lesson, and then invited everybody to come up and pray. And he said, because everyone was a Christian, I gave up a short Bible lesson, invited people to pray. It was about 930. Let me say here that I no more expected what was to follow than I expected to be the first man to land on the moon. I hadn't been doing any unusual praying or fasting. I hadn't been praying that I would have such an experience. In fact, I hadn't even thought about such a thing. Everyone was praying around the front, and I knelt on the platform behind or beside a folding chair near the pulpit, and I began to pray in tongues, and I heard the voice say, come up hither. And at first, I didn't realize that the voice was speaking to me. I thought everybody had heard it. Come up hither, the voice said again. And then I looked, and I saw Jesus standing about where the top of the tent would be. And as I looked up again, the tent disappeared. The folding chairs had disappeared. The tent pole had disappeared. The pulpit had disappeared. And God permitted me to see into the spirit realm. You know, the Bible says in the last days, says God, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh from Joel and Acts 2. But then he said, your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. That's how you know whether you're young or old, I guess. <laughs> you know the other way to know whether you're young or old? You watch people's reactions when you fall down. <laughs> if they laugh, you're young. If they go, oh, you're old. <laughs> I'm just telling you. I heard that somewhere. I thought that was about right. <laughs> uh, anyway, where was I? Jesus was standing there, and I stood in his presence, and he was holding a crown in his hand. This crown was so extraordinarily beautiful that human language cannot begin to describe it. Jesus told me this is a soul winner's crown. My people are so careless and indifferent. This crown is for every one of my children. I speak and say, go speak to this one or pray for that one, but my people are too busy. Now, this was in 1950. Think it's any busier now? I think we got more distractions going on now than they did in 1950. All right, but they say they're too busy. They put it off when I ask them to go or to pray, and souls are lost because they will not obey me. Now, there's where I, 
was speaking into can we limit God, right? There is how we can limit him. He wants to work, but he doesn't just come and do it apart from us. He asks us to be his messengers. He asks us to be his co-laborers. And so he doesn't want folks to go to hell, but he's dependent on us. That just makes me want to cry because I'm like, Lord, don't depend on me for something that weighty. And yet he did. And he believes in you. I want you to see that shows that he believes in you. You can do it. Now, folks that have that evangelist gift or whatever, they're like, man, I love talking to people about Jesus. I love talking to people about Jesus in this atmosphere when we're discipling and training and equipping. But going up to strangers and talking to folks about Jesus isn't quite as fun for me. Because I found out they sometimes they don't want to know about Jesus. They get mad. They want to reject you. They call you names. They, they'll poke at you. And, well, and that's not too fun for anybody. Anybody like that? Oh, I like to get made fun of. It's one of my favorite things. Now, but, but evangelists have this love just glowing in them. But here Jesus said it's not just evangelists. He said this is for every one of my children, that we're all called into a ministry of soul winning. So I began to ask the Lord and say, Lord, would you make me a soul winner? I know you can. And I know I'm rough cut lumber here. I mean, I'm, I'm rough on the edges. But, Lord, could you make a soul winner out of me? I think every one of his children should be asking him that. Lord, make me a soul winner. Well, yeah, but I'm afraid or I'm unqualified, blah, blah. He's heard all of it. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He, 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 when you say yes to him, he gets to work in to take off what's hindering. Come on, all we got to do is say yes to him and, and, and praise the Lord and then begin to listen and yield and obey. <laughs> Brother Jesse, when he went to heaven, he talked to a bunch of people. He said, it's amazing. Everyone knows your name there and you know them. He said, I talked to Abraham. I talked to Paul. I talked to David. I talked to Jonah. He said, I was there. He said, guess what Jonah told me? Because he said, I asked Jonah. I'm giving away part of his thing, but anyway, I just like it, so I'm going to. Uh, he said, I was talking to Jonah. Brother Jesse said that. And you know Jesse, he's just funny and just happy, you know, and short and got that white hair. And I like Jesse. I, and he, he's going to be in Glenwood uh, here in May down on a Wednesday night. I, so anyway, um, he said, I asked Jonah, hey, Jonah, what's it like being in the, in the belly of that fish? He said, you know, Jonah didn't even answer me. That, he said, I'll tell you what it was like to disobey God. <laughs> he said, you're asking the wrong question, is what he's saying. <laughs> you're asking what it felt like to be in the belly of the fish. The question you should have been asking is, why is it important to obey God? <laughs> come on. All right. So, anyway, right after, right when Jesse was getting ready to come back to the earth, because he was up there for a while, and... Uh, and Paul was encouraging him. He said he was talking to Paul. He said, Paul's a little guy, about 5'2", bald. And he said, Paul looked at me with fire in his eyes, and he put up at his fist and said, preach the gospel, Jesse. Preach the gospel. And he said, oh, Paul, I'm going to preach the gospel. And then David told him to do something. And then uh, Jonah said to obey God, Jesse. <laughs> ah, and I was just like, that's right. That's the right guy to preach that message. Obey God, Jesse. It's important that we obey God. His will doesn't happen on earth automatically. His will happens when his children obey him. Praise the Lord. Man, there's doctrines in the church world and in the world today <clears throat> where folks just think God's will has always happened if it was meant to be. Well, what are you talking about? God's will does not always happen in a planet of almost 8 billion free will human beings. Does God's will always happen in your life, or do you get up and decide not to pray sometimes? Well, it was God's will. You did pray, but you decided not to because you're a free will. So God's will doesn't always just happen. His will happens when his people say yes and begin to move, and that's our job as a church. It's not a job. It's our calling. It's our ministry, and he gives each of us a place of ministry. And everyone I'm looking at in here and those watching online, you're all ministers of Jesus Christ if, if you're his. And if you're not, you need to give your life to him. And then you'll be a minister of Jesus Christ. 
We're all ministers. He's got a job for you. That doesn't mean we all stand in the pulpit or in, in, in a certain ministry gift, but every single one of us is a minister wherever we go. You're his ambassadors. Come on. So what did Jonah say? Obey God, Jesse. <laughs> he said, everybody said when he saw him, hey, Jesse. He said, they never called me Mr. Duplantis or Reverend or anything. They just all called me by my first name. Hey, Jesse. Praise the Lord. I like that. When you go to heaven, everybody's going to know you. When you get there, they're going to say, hey, Jason. They're going to say, hey. Come on. Hey, Mike. Hey, Wade. Everybody see you. Hey, man. Man, that's pretty cool. What about heaven? It's a real place. God wants us to go. But he, he, he sent Jesus so we could be there with him. But he also needs us to be these soul winners. He wants to give you a crown. There is a golden crown of salvation that, that comes <clears throat> as I read this in this book. And the scripture talks about it too. And robes of different robes and, and, and crowns and different things that we get when we go to heaven. Um, <clears throat> but one of these crowns is soul winner's crown. It goes to those that, that win souls. And God wants every one of us to have that. One of the others, uh, I can't remember if it was Brother Jesse or the lady in the book, Mary Baxter, but said that your mansion that the Lord builds you there. Go to John 14. We're going to read from there. Your mansion that the Lord builds from, for you there that he's preparing. He said every time you, you lead someone to Christ, a big diamond, and I think they said the size of a, a cinder block, you know, like a building block, a big diamond is fashioned into your mansion somewhere as the Lord sees fit. Woo! Imagine that. <laughs> Instead of like bricks, my house built out of diamonds. If you're a soul winner, see, that doesn't bother the Lord at all. It bothers us. We think, well, I, w such waste. Now you're thinking like man again. God doesn't even think that way. He doesn't think waste. He thinks there's more than enough. He's El Shaddai, not El Chipo. Come on, he's thinking more than enough. He's not thinking lack. It doesn't even enter his thinking. He's like, oh, there's plenty more where that came from. <laughs> uh, so you're going to have some you're going to have some diamonds in your house. You you become a soul winner. Come on. The angels every time I preach a salvation message and someone responds, they're writing it down. Every time you would save someone, they they're aware of it. Bring them to church. Come on. They're writing it down in their records. And I'm telling you, I was reading this that's pretty amazing book some of these things that happen all right there is a hell to shun there is a heaven to gain <clears throat> that's why we must be soul winners because by default every human being on earth is headed to hell because we were born into sin because of what adam and eve did all those years ago it got into our dna we caught the virus you're a carrier of it now the minute you were born with it right but now that you're grown up and you know right and wrong, you have a, you're held accountable for your decisions. <laughs> she talked about in heaven, the children in heaven. The angels took her on a tour and actually showed her some things on the earth. Uh, she said the Lord showed her a woman in the hospital and, and the angel said to her, this woman is having a miscarriage. The baby's only three months old. And is going to die, but I want you to see what happens. And she saw the baby die. She saw the spirit of the baby and these angels that went down and captured this baby's spirit and brought it up to heaven and set it on the throne of God. And uh, the, the, all of heaven began to be, rejoice and erupt with joy. And the hand of God came down and began to fashion this three-month-old little baby into, a, the, she said, the most handsome good-looking young man I'd ever seen in my life. God made that out of that little baby and then began to, all of heaven began to rejoice. She said, when I went to hell, she said, I was toured there for 30 days or however long she was there. She said, I never saw a baby or a child in hell, young child. Babies that are aborted, babies that are miscarried, young babies, they go to heaven. According to what she said, and I got scripture we could stand on. I don't want to get into a bait, debate with anyone, but, you know, I believe that. Man, that's good news. Now, well, that's good news. Come on, some ladies that maybe had an abortion, and you think, I wonder what, or maybe you're carried or riddled with guilt because of that. The Lord will forgive you, and your baby's with the, heaven, with the Lord in heaven, and you're going to get to see him one day. Man, that's awesome. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Or la ladies that you've had a miscarriage. I know folks in our family have miscarriages or different things. Your baby, you think, well, I only got X amount of kids. Guess what? 
You got some more. If you had a miscarriage and you're going to be reunited with them in heaven, man, that's the wonders of heaven. Praise the Lord. Well, but there is a hell to shun, you know. We talked about that. I don't want to go further into that. I mean, I feel like I haven't covered it thoroughly enough, but I guess you guys can study into it, okay? <clears throat> we need to know more about these things. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. I told you John 14, we'll, we'll do both. Let's go to John 14 first. <clears throat> says, verse 1 through 6 of John 14, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. That's interesting that he said mansions and not just like shacks. The Lord chose to build you a mansion. huh? If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Why did Jesus leave them? What's he been doing up there all these years? Preparing a place for all the people that would believe in him from that day until this. He's been up there building. Remember, he is a carpenter. He's been up there building. The Lord built your house. When Jesse went up there, that's what Paul said to him. He said, the Lord built your mansion himself. The Lord himself built your mansion. Woo! Yeah. He's preparing a place. Heaven is a place prepared. It's not a random thing. It's a place that's been prepared for those that believe in Jesus. Amen. There's only one way in. Let's keep reading. Uh, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Come on, and where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Now, why wouldn't you want to go? Why do folks not want to go? Something in their heart set against God, set against Lord, some kind of rebellion, some kind of something, some kind of that nature of the devil that somehow got into people that just, eh, they want to just give God the bird, you know, flip him the bird and say, I don't need you. That's the that rebellious nature of the devil, that's the thing that's going to keep you out of heaven if you let it. But you don't have to yield to that. Just say, no, 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 no. I want to be saved. I need to be saved. I don't want to spend eternity in hell. <laughs> so he said, well, what if you're wrong? What if there is no hell and no heaven? Well, I'll still be safe. What if you're wrong and you think there is no hell or heaven? What if you're wrong? <laughs> Come on. All right. How do we get there? He said, there's only one way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Nehemiah 9, 6, you alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all of their hosts, the Lord and everything on it, the seas, excuse me, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them. You preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. That's Nehemiah 9, 6. Amen. The focus of all of our hopes and desires should be to spend eternity with the Lord. He said, set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. It's not worth, there's nothing on this earth worth being so occupied over. You, you know that by now, right? We're here on a mission. We're citizens of heaven. If you're a believer, you've been born of heaven. You're a citizen of heaven. Your citizenship comes from there. You got papers from heaven, man. Because you were born there. But now you're here on this earth on a mission. You're here uh, on a job. That you're here for work. Amen. Well, so Paul talked about that. He said, anyone called to warfare doesn't entangle himself with the affairs of life, that he may have pleased the one that enlisted him, right? If you're here as a part of the Lord's army and a part of the Lord's workforce here, it's not, this life isn't about getting all the good stuff and, and, and comfort and ease. No, that's what heaven's for. You're going to have eternity in that condition. But now it's about bringing people out of darkness into light. And now it's about obeying God and honoring God and representing Him to the people of this world. That's what we're here for. Amen. Amen. Come on now. That's, that's awesome. It's also weighty, but it's awesome. And it's really not, you know, when you get in the presence of the Lord, even very serious things, God transacts His most serious transactions in the atmosphere of joy. <laughs> he'll come in and just say, come on, let's, let's, have a, let's have joy unspeakable and full of glory. He, he wants your life to be joyful. He doesn't want you serious all the time, even though there are serious things. 
Come on. The Sabbath was his idea, the, the rest. He wants you to have a day off. He wants you to enjoy your time off. The Lord wants you to enjoy your time off. Not instead of worshiping him, but through worshiping him. And even however it flows in your schedule is different for everybody. I talked to somebody that was just dead set on we're supposed to worship the Lord on Saturday, you know. Well, I was like, I'm pretty sure we're supposed to worship him every day. I was thinking, <laughs> like, which day you worship? I'm more concerned about who's worshiping and who's being worshiped and, like, who are you worshiping? Are you worshiping a day? Like, Jesus, he kept irking the, the Pharisees over this Sabbath stuff. Now, he, he likes the rest thing, but, boy, as far as don't do this on this day or whatever, he would just come do it right in their faces and go, what are you going to do about that? Just stretch out your hand, the man with the withered hand. I mean, it's always on the Sabbath day. You pick up your bed and go home and, and walk. It's always on the Sabbath day. Why, why does he keep doing that? He's trying to show you rest is important, but worshiping a day is not the same as worshiping the Lord who made the day. And the day was made for the people to, so that they would learn to take their life and, and glorify God with it. The day's not God. The day was given to keep our thoughts and minds on the Lord. So don't forsake your day of worshiping the Lord, but worship the Lord every day, not just on a certain day. Praise the Lord. All right. We better roll. All right. So heaven's prepared for you. There's actually three heavens spoken of in the scripture. The first heaven is really just the, the sky right here where the birds fly around and the clouds are. That's referred to as the first heaven. The second heaven is really like outer space, you know, after you leave the earth's atmosphere and the sun's up there and the solar system and the, the milky, you know, the, the stars and all that stuff. But then the, the, the third heaven is actually uh, the planet heaven where God lives. This lady, when she went to heaven, she said, the best I can describe it is heaven is a planet, just like earth is a planet, but it's way up there. And she, she said, when I went up there, went with the angel, we were flying at the speed of light, just whoo, faster than the, just going fast. And then we arrive up at this, what looks like a big planet that's made. And the city of God is there. And there's mountains there. The, when Brother Jesse was there, the angel said, take Brother Jesse back by the way of the mountains. He likes mountains. So they wanted him just to see the mountains in heaven. I don't know. Uh, I like mountains. I, 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 I guess beaches are okay too, but, but I like the mountains. I don't know. I guess when I get to heaven, if the Lord made me a mansion, that he's going to make you something I like. No, he's going to make you something you like. If you don't like houses in the mountains, he's not going to make you one. Maybe you just like a, a condo. Well, he'll give you one of those. <laughs> he will. He'll just give you what you like. Heaven's about the Lord preparing a place for you for eternity, for joy. For what you like. And so I was on this scrolling or something. These pictures come up, you know, these mountain homes, like these mansions in the mountains, green grass. And the, the buildings, the houses are lodges. They're made out of big old, big old logs. And then all that nice rock and decks on them. And I'm, and I'm like, I sent one to Tracy. said, that's what my mansion's going to be like in heaven. It's going to look kind of like this. <laughs> the Lord knows. I'm, it's going on record like the Lord already knows. But it's like, I, I'll, that's going to be awesome, man. So you may not have it on earth. Well, whoo, whoop de doo You're going to have one for eternity. It doesn't really matter what you have on the earth. We're just here working anyway. Like, do you have to stay at the Ritz-Carlton while you're there for work? I mean, if you're just out there working, just stay somewhere and go to work. It's not really about having the nice place here. It's about getting the job done here, and we'll have the nice place when we get there. Praise the Lord. Amen. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. Can you, let's read that together, 2 through 4. This is Paul speaking, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven, and I know such a man. Whether in the body or out of the body I do not know, God knows. How he was caught up into the paradise and heard inexpressible words which are not lawful for a man to utter. Mm, caught up into paradise. Now, remember, Jesus on the cross said to them, man, tonight you will be with me in paradise. And yet, that paradise at the time of Jesus was on the cross was not up in heaven. At that time, paradise was actually referred to as Abraham's bosom or paradise. They were interchangeable words. We can read about it in Luke 16. Let's go look at Luke 16 real quick. I'll just, I mean, 
Let's, let's learn about it, I guess, huh? The rich man and Lazarus, verse 19, Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores. He was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. So notice, when this beggar died, uh, the angels carried him. His spirit and his soul carried him. Now his body, when your body dies, it just lays there wherever you died until somebody picks it up and moves it. Your body without your spirit in it is not alive. It just poof. Hmm? Now, someday that body's going to be resurrected and glorified. We're told of that in 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, 1 Thessalonians 4 and some other place. That, that body will be glorified at the second coming of the Lord. Amen. Not at the rapture, but at the second coming of the Lord. Or excuse me, it is at the, it's at the time of the rapture. But the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those that are alive will be glorified and meet the Lord in the air. He said, at the twinkling of an eye, your body's going to be changed, man. Anyway, in any case, his body just laid where it was, this beggar, but the angels took his spirit to Abraham's bosom. Now, Abraham's bosom was different than hell, yet it was one of the outer compartments of what was known at hell. I taught you that a couple weeks back, but he cried out. Let's, let's look next, uh, verse 23. Oh, no, uh, uh, yeah. And being, the rich man also died and was buried, being in torments in Hades. Now, he's in a different place. Being in torments. Everybody say torment. Hell's a place of torment. And he lifted up his eyes, and he saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Well, so now we're here, we're talking about hell again, but notice that Lazarus was in a different place than this rich man was, but the rich man still thought Lazarus was his servant. <laughs> Can you see that? Send him to get dip his finger in water and come touch my tongue. Like he still remembers that he, ever, you still have all your faculties in hell. You still remember it? You will read down. You, he remembers his family. He remembers everything. He's, he, he remembers Lazarus. But Lazarus is in a place where there's at least water. In hell, there's none. The fire never, never quenched, never ceases. Well, we need to know that. But notice this, he called this Abraham's bosom, and he's speaking to Abraham here. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your life you received good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, and now he is comforted and you are tormented. Besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. He doesn't want his family coming there. He doesn't want his brothers coming there. Hmm. And Moses, Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Hmm. Sobering. So when, when Brother Jesse went to heaven, the first place he got when he got up there and he he, he ran into Abraham. He said, Abraham had big old barrel chest. He said, I talked to Abraham. And he said, Abraham said, this is my bosom. This is paradise. And Jesse said, hey, like, like in the Bible, uh, uh, like when Jesus said, tonight you'll be with me in paradise. And the rich man and Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom. And, and he said, Abraham said, oh, I see you've read the Bible. <laughs> see, up in heaven, they know about the Bible. Everything comes back to Jesus and the Scripture and the Word of God. You know, this is the authority. Amen. We're expected to know it here, and we're given it so that we can know and be prepared for the things that are prepared for. And so when Jesus rose from the dead, you see, he went down to paradise with that man on the cross with him, beside him. And he said, tonight you'll be with me in paradise. But Jesus was three days and nights in the torments there for us. But when he rose from the dead, it said he led captivity captive. You know who he led captive? It was those righteous dead from the Old Testament that were in Abraham's bosom. He opened the gates and let them out, and they went up with him. It said people saw the people came out of the graves and stuff when Jesus rose from the dead, man. That would have been wild. There's Aunt Martha. 
She died 20 years ago. Wait, she's walking around. Wait, wait. <laughs> I mean, think about it. What in the world? Anyway, the, they were held in captive in Abraham's bosom, this place called Abraham's bosom or paradise, but paradise changed after Jesus raised from the dead. It used to be that compartment of hell. They were held there in reserve until Jesus' blood shed in his death and resurrection. But now that he rose from the dead, those deemed righteous from the old covenant law and all that were taken by Jesus into heaven. They're with the Lord today, and Abraham's up there. Amen. And when, when one of us dies, when a believer dies, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You immediately go to be with the Lord in paradise. Now, your body is going to go in the grave, but you, you, you aren't your body. It's just what your house you live in. You'll be amazed at how you're still you, though your body's not with you. <laughs> all the thoughts you have, all the things you desire, all your memories are going to be with you, though your body's in the grave. Come on. Are you okay with me? Okay. You don't have any business as a Christian fearing death. None of us do. Death for you is promotion. Death for you. Paul actually said, well, I, I would rather die. I'd rather go be with the Lord. Can we read those scriptures and then I'll wrap this up for, the, for today. There's more to, much more to say, but let's wrap this. Look at, these, look at this, Philippians 1, 19 through 26. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ According to my earnest expectation, now he's in prison, you know, so he's writing from that condition. According to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. He's like, I use my body to glorify Jesus. And if I die, then my body's going to glorify Jesus in death. But if I keep on leaving, I'm going to glorify Jesus in my body and life. Amen. That's, that'll preach. What does he say then? For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I cannot tell. For I'm hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Woo! Far better. Woo! <laughs> Heaven's far better. Anybody that's ever been there and came back to talk about it said, Oh, man, it's so much better. Never feel sorry for anyone that died and went to heaven. They said, it's so much better. Oh, it's far better. They're not, they're not just in a better place. It's far better. Okay? All right. And which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for your progress and joy of faith that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming again to you. He's like, I could go, I could stay, but I'm going to stay to help your joy. <laughs> God left Paul to help the Philippians with their joy. The whole book of Philippians, the theme of it is joy. He wrote it from prison. A man in prison rejoicing. Woo, come on. He saw something folks aren't seeing. That's why he's talking about this, and, and that's why I'm sharing these things with you. I want you to see these things. Praise the Lord. All right. So God has made a way and a provision for all of us to go to heaven. No one has to go to hell. But the message must be proclaimed because Jesus and belief in him is the avenue that gets us in. That'll get you in if you've never received Christ, but it'll get anyone you tell that decides to believe that. It'll get them in. You carry with you the key to heaven. You carry with you the keys of the kingdom. You can give them to anyone, and if you give that message, that gospel, and they choose to believe it, they will go to heaven as they pray and receive Christ. That doesn't have to come from an ordained preacher. It can come from you. You're the body of Christ. You're an ambassador of Christ. You can share that message. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for dying, shedding your blood, Lord Jesus, rising from the dead. Father, for sending Jesus as a gift for us, as a sacrifice for our sin. Holy Spirit, for helping us to see Jesus, to know Jesus. Oh, oh, help us to see. We're just getting little glimpses here, Lord, of what heaven's going to be like. What a wonderful thing. In days gone by, the, the, the old timers used to sing a lot about heaven. In our generation, it's hard to find a song about heaven. You do want us to have times of heaven on earth, but you also want us to be thinking and prepared to go see our Savior, and to live forever in fellowship and in union with you there, Lord. This was your plan. 
So, Father, I'm praying that under the sound of my voice that no one would reject Jesus Christ and choose to go to hell. Lord, in our lives, in our sphere of influence, let no one reject your offer and choose to go to hell. Lord, we pray for salvation of souls. We pray for our families, our friends, our neighbors, our neighborhoods, our city, our county, our valley, our region. We pray even for this generation, Lord, to the ends of the earth. We pray for a great harvest of souls. Lord, let the body of Christ be mobilized with the message of the gospel. There's so much There's so much you've given us to to bring this to pass, Lord. In heaven, there are storehouses of, of body parts and healings and different blessings that you're trying to get to people on earth, even sinners. You've already prepared them, Lord. And we, as your ministers and your children, we're called to deliver these things to folks, to pray and get answers, to pray and see you answer and heal folks and deliver them and bring them. Lord, there's so much involved in this. Help us to become the laborers and the soul winners, the laborers and the harvest of the last day. I pray it. And I bless your people, Lord. Let, let there be great hope and joy in our hearts, knowing that we were prepared to live with you eternally in heaven. Lord, give us just a little glimpse, if you would, into the glory of your kingdom and your world. I mean, oh, hallelujah. You'd have to be crazy not to want it if you just saw a glimpse. Lord, give us a glimpse. Give us a glimpse. Help us to show other people a glimpse, Lord. Help us to carry some of heaven in our heart, in our voice, in our life, Lord, that we can deposit your kingdom life into others. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. You know, psychologists I heard say there's three times people change. Number one, when the pain is so hard, so bad, that they feel like I have to change. Or when the reward is so good that they want to change. Or that when you learn enough that you're able to change. And there's probably some truth to all those. In this case, we're talking about the pain is so bad, (laughs) we need to change. The reward is so good, you need to change. And now you know the way. You're able to change. All right, so now you're equipped with that. Use it in your world. Praise the Lord. Stand up with me. Use it in your world. Use it in your family. Come on, tell people about it. Amen. Father, bless your people. May there be the light as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, don't forget to sign up out there. Taco party tonight. Uh, Bring something. Come by and have some tacos with us. Look, you could have tacos by yourself, but you might as well have tacos with us. And and you get get to know some folks. Praise the Lord. It'll be a blessing. God bless.